Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over at Global Foundries today with Subi Ken Gary, who's going to talk about a new 22 nanometer FDSOI. Why don't you give a quick overview of the technology? This is the industry's first 22 nanometer fully depleted SOI technology. That's number one. Number two, this technology delivers FinFET-like performance, but at about 28 nanometer cost. That is exciting to many of the many of our customers. And then when you look at the next part of it, it's about ultra low power consumption. This is the only technology that we know of today that can operate down to 0.4 volts. There's no other technology in the world, not even in the exploratory phase to the best of our knowledge, that can go as low as this technology. The FinFET technology goes at to 0.5, right? It could. It could go down to 0.5, but what we're talking about here is the energy efficiency and the full functionality simply because FDSOI, the 22 FDSOI that we're talking about, that being planar, has less variability compared to a 3D FinFET. 3D FinFET always has some additional variability because of the height of the fin and the width of the fin as we all know. So no matter what you do, you simply cannot compete with the less variable planar technology. That's number one. Number two is from a capacitance point of view, from a device capacitance point of view, FinFET is always inherently higher capacitance compared to a planar 22 FDSOI. Now when you drop the voltage and you're operating at almost near threshold levels, capacitance becomes extremely critical for the AC performance. The third one is the 22 FDSOI gives you flexibility to change the VT dynamically and in real-time applications, which now you can drop the VT much lower, whereas in every other technology, including FinFET, the VT is fixed and hardwired, it's done. So when you drop the voltage, the headroom starts to go down and at some point it will start to fail. So overall, you have the flexibility to operate at a much lower voltage on 22, I mean, rather FDSOI technology and specifically on the 22 FDSOI compared to FinFET. Looking ahead, how much further does this go? If you look at where it is, there are two parts to this. There is the front-end device scaling and then there is the middle of line and the back-end scaling. Both are important, right? On one side, the back-end scaling is the same across the you know any technology, whatever we can do. We all know the last optical node is what we're all looking for to, for the cost effectiveness. And then, of course, we have to move to EUE. That will remain the same for everybody. But when it comes to the front-end device, which is what this FDSY technology is primarily about, FinFET can continue to scale. It has legs to take it at next two or three generations. And then, of course, things have to change. On the FDSOI, we have explored, we are, we are working on our next generation devices. We, we know we can get it down to about 10 nanometer. Will there be any convergence between the FinFETs and the FDSOI, maybe FinFETs on FDSOI? Yes, that, that's a possibility. But the way to look at it is FDSOI is, of course, a two, it's a planar, it's a two dimensional technology, and we want to be able to extend the life of that as much as possible because there are several advantages of remaining on planar, right? Now, if you look at the RF integration as an example, which is going to be very critical going forward because everything in an IoT will have radio in it, right? Or every connected device will have radio in it. How do we make a cost-effective radio? Lower, smaller form factor, lower power, higher performance, low 1 over F noise, higher FT, and better analog characteristics. Those are the key components that we need to look at. Now, if you compare FDSOI with FinFET to meet these requirements, FDSOI shines for many reasons. Number one, the lower capacitance. It gets you much higher RF capability compared to FinFET. Number two, the variability that I just talked about is also very critical in RF and as well as all of the analog devices that drive that RF. And then when you look at the ultra low voltage, it, I already said that FDSOI can operate down to 0.4 volts, where fin, whereas FinFET 
can also go down but it's going to be limited by the capacitance number four you have the adaptive back biasing in FDSOI that if you have to just selectively run at a very high speed you can do that you don't have that capability in FinFET okay and then most important is the thermal budget when you drop the voltage down to 0.4 volts you have the V square benefit which also translates to the thermal budget and you can have a lower thermal budget and therefore a cheaper package for example or maybe I mean and or a better form factor all these are the critical you know requirements for the next wave of semiconductor growth for all its connected devices so we believe FDSI is going to be the place uh, is going to be the technology to drive that so where do you see this playing out how do you see the FinFET's uh, market shaping up versus the various flavors of FDSOI yeah so FinFets have its place, so don't get me wrong, right? FinFets have in the high-end servers, as an example, or the CPUs, or if you want to talk about some of the uh, application-optimized high-end uh, smartphones, for example, FinFets will continue to exist there, and those are that, that's the right thing. But it's going to be at a higher premium, and those markets can support higher premium, and therefore it's okay. But when you look at the rest of the market, Everything else, except the ones that I just mentioned, FDSOI is perfectly suitable and it's optimized for those for, for those applications, from set-top box to wearables to smartwatch to automotive to infotainments, all the way down. So it covers a very wide range of markets. Is it one process fits all or are there different flavors? Of That's a very good question, Ed. So, it's not one size fits all because when you try to do that, we won't be optimal in any of those applications. So we have created multiple flavors of 22 FDSOI. The first one is we call it a 22 FD ULP. That's the base process, the ultra low power process, which gives about 70% lower power than 28 high K. Today, the world is mostly at 28 high K, right? They're looking at to move to the next node. There are some early adopters who have already gone on FinFET, but most of the other market is waiting to see what the next node is. And just, that is a real opportunity for all of us. So 70% lower power on 28 compared to 28 high K. That's the first one. What does that do compared to 28 nanometer FDSOI and uh, FinFET? Yeah, so 28 FDSOI had the first generation FDSOI device. The performance was not really very interesting. We, in fact, had licensed the technology and we did, you know, check it out in the market. But our customers' feedback was not all that great, primarily because of the lack of performance. So that's when we created, we looked at all of this and looked at the next generation FDSOI device, which is what we have today on our 22 FDSOI. And how does it compare to the FinFETs? Yeah. So in terms of the FinFETs, the ultra low power uh, process that uh, that I just described, it has, like I said, it, you can go down to 0.4 volts. So people are talking about taking FinFET down to maybe 0.5 or 4.6 in that range. So this will always be lower than that. That's number one. So we do believe the, the dynamic power and the thermal budget and the integration of RF compared to FinFET is going to be far better on FDSOI. RF and analog integration is a little bit more challenging on FinFET compared to a planar FDSOI. Those are some of the real good benefits. How, how about the other flavors? Yeah, thanks. So the second flavor is what we call as a 22 FD ULL. This is optimized for ultra low leakage and you can get down to a one pico amp per micron range now this is excellent for some of the let's say the Bluetooth okay or if you talk about Zigbee's and some of the connectivity device connected devices that require ultra low leakage for uh, for most of those applications or battery power which is mostly in standby let's say but battery power is very critical ULL is the technology so this is the ones that you may want to sit on a battery for five ten years sitting out in the field right you, you got it that's exactly right and then the third one is the 22FD, what we call as the UHP. Now, like you said, a 22FD SOI really, really covers a very wide range of market. 
compared to FinFET. But however, if there are customers who want to have a single technology to be able to cover a very wide range of applications from sensors to servers, then we are also offering this flavor where the design infrastructure would be pretty much the same. The PDKs and the design IPs could all be very similar, but there are some additional things that we are doing on the UHP, which is to give better RCs on the back end, different performance optimized metal stacks as an example, giving a forward bias, forward bias that gives you much better performance and even the overdrive. I mean, there are many other things, but these are some of the high level things that we are offering. So in fact, now 22 FDSOI can go and compete with FinFET even in the high performance markets. So that's the third flavor. The fourth one is what we call as the 22 FD RFA. This is for the RF, RF application specifically. Now in this case, we like I already said, the 1 over F noise is fantastic. FD is really good, which means you can have very high performance RF because of lower capacitance. And so we're doing a few things to ensure that you can integrate the radio, inductors, capacitors, all of those things and we have ultra thick metal devices I mean metal stacks that are needed for RF so everything that is needed to enable RF is packaged into this flavor and as we know the RF is, is very application optimized and very custom oriented so after we acquired IBM as you know uh, IBM was number one in RF or still is number one in RF so we get all that value including some of the top designers and the field application engineers who can work with our customers and optimize the requirements because that is what is key in, in an RF uh, solution. You're coming from the design side, developing a chip. How much harder is this to develop than say a 28 nanometer chip? It's really not very different because the back biasing scheme has been in existence for a long time. If you look at the FPGAs, if you look at some of the mobile phones, some of the other low power applications, people have been doing it for a long time. But the benefit of back bias on a bulk CMOS has started diminishing because the gate leakage dominates and you don't get all the benefit there. Here, because it's isolated, and if you look at the value of the back bias, you can go up to about, let's say in this case, 1.8 volts to almost 2 volts of back bias, which translates to about one tenth. Of that which is about 200 millivolts of change in VT so it's not very hard but there is about let's say about 10 percent extra effort that is needed some of the metrics that come up on the design side are defectivity um, variability in the process and also yield how does this work versus some of the older nodes yeah so the defectivity people talk about you know the SOI substrate defectivity but in fact we have checked thoroughly and we looked at our substrate manufacturers, they, they do a fantastic job of, in terms of metrology to ensure the uniformness or the uniform, uh, the, the thickness of the silicon to may, be maintained at a certain level. And they maintain it to a few angstroms level and that's perfectly fine to, ma to maintain the global variations within the you know, required levels. So that's number one. Number two is variability wise from a manufacturing and a device point of view it's already better than FinFET because this is a 2D planar versus a FinFET that has 3D which has additional variabilities. The third one is this is already a fully depleted device okay compared to a bulk CMOS this is a fully de depleted device so there's no RDF component the random dopant fluctuation so therefore you have less variability. Now those are all the device and the technology related stuff then comes the variability <coughs> on the design side when you look at from the design side unlike the PDSOI where there's a history effect and people were had to worry about the variabilities depending on the first switching or the second switching and things like that you don't have to worry any of that here this is a fully depleted SOI very similar to the bulk CMOS from that point of view so there's no variability from there the second one is people put in a lot of margins, what we call as the OCV margins, on chip variation margins of the whole margins that you have to put in. But on this technology, because the variability is much smaller, you can tighten those corners 
and we have in fact published the complete details of the sign off margins and how it needs to be done so people are going to get familiar this will be some learning curve there but it's not a big deal because it's all in terms of improving the design and tightening the corners and, and, and improving the margins so it's all for the good so from that point of view uh, from a design margin point of view also it's going to be better but at the same time there's some learning curve there to change the methodology and you know, change the sign off points yeah one of the key metrics for the industry has always been Moore's law what were you looking to get at each new node with Moore's law in recent nodes and how does FDSOY compare with that wow Historically, if you look at it, the idea was to get maybe 50% shrink, right, which means 2x the dies, but we're willing to add maybe 20% more cost into that. So the net benefit would be about 30%. Historically, that has been the case, more or less. But then, like I said earlier, things start slowing down at 20 nanometer because a double to get that shrink, we had to add double patterning. And in some applications specifically, when the number of double patterning was six to eight layers of metal and double that because of the VS, so about 14 to 16 layers additional was just not acceptable. For example, in graphics, as in, you know, graphics have very straight stacks typically. So about eight layers of one X layers means one X double pattern plus the VS that go with it. In some other applications, like in mobile, for example, Typically, it's two to three layers of one X, and then you go to you know a kind of a telescopic stack. So the number of double padding layers there were much smaller. So anyway, the point here is 30% cost benefit is historically what has been assumed to be the right thing um, to stay on the trajectory, and and that kind of slowed down. But with 22 FDSOI, we wanted to continue to give that 30% to our customers from the previous node. And that's really what we have attempted to do here by avoiding all double patterns, number one. And number two is when, when customers move from one node to another node, while well, cost is one of the most important factors, they also look at additional benefit and additional value or any other differentiating value so they can differentiate their products. In this case, in addition to giving the cost benefit, we're also providing variety of differentiating features like I just described for example the ad adaptive back biasing the software control transistor characteristics all the way down running running the product all the way down to 0.4 volts integrating RF and post silicon tuning or trimming if you want to call it these are all the additional benefits that come with it in addition to the cost that is why this technology is exciting for many of the new applications we've been hearing promises about FDSOI for years why is it suddenly different? <laughs> okay, that's a very good question. So, the whole idea is, I think I have to say the answer this in multiple parts. If you go back, let's say two generations, the bulk CMOS was meeting all the requirements. There was no need to change. For 30 years, it has worked at scale. People have are used to designing with bulk CMOS. They know ins and outs of it. There's expertise. They didn't want to change because it was continuing to scale. The problem was once the bulk CMOS started started to slow down or in because of the you know the sub thresholds uh, and then the just the planar was slowing down as you know this technology scaling. The whole world started looking at the options. FDSOI is one, FinFET was the other and there were some more exotic technologies that were pushed out to the next generations. But if you take these two primary candidates, even we ourselves had very seriously looked at both for almost two years, and I'm sure the rest of the industry also looked at which horse to ride. There are pros and cons. FinFed gave you the performance benefit, but it was very challenging from a manufacturing point of view because you have billions of fins that you have to make sure you know they they really yield. But technology is improved. We all know how to make that happen. That's good. The other one was the FDSOI. FDSOI was still a planar technology or is still a planar technology. But the first generation FDSOI did not have the performance that was required to compete with, let's say, the next generation bulk CMOS, which is 20 nanometer or even the FinFET, right? 
So which is one of the reasons it didn't work. But when the next generation FDSOI device was invented and we have seen that working which is what we are using now. So that is the choice that we made. We took the last single patterning node and plugged in the most advanced FDSOI device into it which is the best combination from a cost because it's all single pattern performance because it's the second generation FDSOI basically a 40 nanometer FDSOI device that gives you FinFET like performance. The combination is what is driving this growth or interest in, in the customer base and that is truly the inflection point. Where does this shake out versus say SIGI for future nodes as well? So SIGI is it's a material right so we can always consider that once that is mature and we know what needs to be done we can also go and apply that on, on the FDSOI to take that to the next level. So that is the material aspect of it. So the, the front end device, now the key here is the 2D planar versus the 3D FinFET. Those are the two main or primary candidates that we're talking about. The rest in terms of the optical and UV, like I already said, that will be common between the two. You can plug in any device in any of the chassis, as we call it, the middle of line and the back end. Super Gary, thanks for a great explanation. Thank you, Ed, for having me here. Really appreciate it.